Are you already recording? Yeah. Wow, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Murder. What did we talk about last time on a serious note? John Efren. Dale Cavanaugh. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, JDC. <laughs> uh, the Efren episode did really good on YouTube. Yay. Mm. Alone, but pretty good on its own. But really good on YouTube. Interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. Efren Saldivar. Salvidar. Salvidar. Saldivar. I can't remember what it was. Efren El Salvador. No, nope, it wasn't, wasn't Salvador. It. It's salad bar <laughs> <laughs> salad bar would be close welcome to another episode of healthcare horrors my name is alicia caracella a training and development specialist i'm ashley boyce a brand specialist and oh. if you can hear the weird chewing sound in the background that's my dog chewing on i think it's like a duck throat dog introduce chew. a duck throat dog Just chew duck throat She's our special guest. Introduce her. Our special guest today is Alu, a husky, and she's chewing on a bone in the background, if you can hear her. She's, provi- <laughs> she's providing commentary. Oh, okay. a, a duck. Thro- a duck. <laughs> a duck it's like an actual I duck. I think, yeah, from an actual oh. duck. It's one of those, like, comes from a real We hmm. in America animal. Don't, don't know our currencies or our duck throats, <laughs> our duck parts. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, well, Dolan on the knobs. Dolan, who is a mad, mad crap talker. <laughs> a, a crap talker? Yeah, I'm keeping it PG over here. I'm working on okay. cussing less. Shit talker. Oh. I'm, I'm not really. Out. I can say it. <laughs> I was going to say, why are you trying to dial it back? Um, I don't know. I really am trying to cuss less. I cuss a lot. <sighs> All right. So... Oh. <laughs> Let's get into it. Who did we talk about last time? J D C. John Dale Cavanaugh. 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 You are so close. Boom. Good uh, job. He was not cool. <laughs> Do you remember anything else about him? Yeah, he killed his family. That's that's that one, right? He killed his son. Or is that Efren? Life insurance policies. He Mm. was one of those who liked life insurance policies. Mm. Yes. He killed his son, though, right? That's how it all started? Mm Mm-hmm. One of his sons. Yeah. It's coming back to me. (laughs) They all start blurring together. I was quizzing you, but honestly, I didn't know. (laughs) Oh, I'm, like, waiting for you guys to tell me if I'm right or wrong. No, we haven't recorded in so long. I know. It's good to be back. We don't remember things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You've been busy training some new recruiting classes. Yes. We've been busy with meet and greets and getting ready for TravCon in September. Yeah. So uh, everything is just crazy. Busy. Okay. Who are we talking about today? JBA. Oh John. My goodness. Bodkin. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> Basically, anybody who has three names is going to get whatever. The initials. Yes. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. But I, w- I will call him John Bodkin Adams. Okay. So that's who we're talking about today. And he was born on January 21st, 1899. And when I was doing this research, my brain kept saying 1989. (laughs) Over and over and over. My dyslexia is a story for another day. I'm not actually diagnosed dyslexic, but I actually think I might be. So anyway. You're dyslexia. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I am. 1899. 1899. My brain does that too with numbers. Really? Yeah. Um, mm. It does it with words to me too. So <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, just 31 years old and just realizing something's, something's a little weird here. Anywho, he's an Aquarius, a weird Aquarius, just like me. <laughs> an Aquarians born on January 21st are unique cool on the outside they possess a magnetism that puts them in the spotlight although they can appear somewhat egotistical they are often generous souls sexual spiritual and intelligent these fun loving men and women seem to have it all and on their terms they can see the humor in things even in themselves so apparently his birthday special and so is he Mm. (laughs) yeah he's special all right where is he from? He Where is, was he born? Yes, John Bodkin Adams was born and raised in Randallstown, Ulster, Ireland. 
and he was born to a very religious family of Plymouth Brethren, which is a Protestant sect of which he remained a member for his entire life. His father's name was Samuel, and he was a preacher in the local congregation and a watchmaker by day. Did you look into the religion at all? I didn't, but if you did. Yeah, I, I looked into it just a little bit because I was curious, and it sounds like they are a very strict religious group about like just strictly worshiping the Bible. and Like the Calvinists. That Dolan taught us about. Mm. Yes, yes. That was also in that one, the last <laughs> I remember episode. remember that, yeah. Yeah. Ah, but they would also not visit other churches. Um, some members would go as far as not even associating with people outside their religion. And apparently some people who are a part of this religious group in today's society um, don't have computers, radios, TVs. They don't own pets. Oh, they wow. might not even go to universities or get involved in politics. Voting, sinning is a huge no-no. Mm. So it sounds like a very strict religious group. Lots of rules that we will later find out that John Adams doesn't really follow. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not a rule follower. <laughs> no. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for telling us. Hey, no problem. I just assume when they mention they grew up like in a super religious household that it was very strict, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so his dad was a preacher and a watchmaker. And then he was also interested in cars, which is a passion that he passed along to John. So in 19, 1896, <laughs> guys, I'm going to do this the whole time. 1896, um, Samuel, his dad, was 39 years of age when he married Ellen Bodkin. She was 30. John was their first son, and he had a brother after that named William Samuel in 1903. In 1914, um, Samuel died of a stroke. Four years later, his brother died in the 1918 influenza pandemic. So um, by 1918, in the span of four years, his dad and his brother both passed away. So after this, he attends Coleraine Academical Institution for several years. Uh, and he was at the Queen's University of Belfast at age 17, where he was seen as someone who was more of like a lone wolf type all by himself. Um, his lecturers, teachers, professors um, labeled him this partly because of an illness he had he had tuberculosis and missed a year of studies hmm. but i mean to have a year of tuberculosis like yeah you're pretty lucky to be alive yeah i mean not lucky back for other the, people back in the 1800s in the future but yeah mm -hmm. so he graduated in 1921 and he failed to qualify for honors but he um, in 1921, Surgeon Arthur Rendell Short offered him a position as an assistant houseman at Bristol Royal Infirmary. He spent a year there but did not do a good job. So Adams applied for a job as a general practitioner in a Christian practice in Eastbourne, Sussex. So um, I don't know what an assistant houseman is at a, an infirmary, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's like. Like a tech, what it would be today, like hmm. someone who passes meds. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Either way, he didn't let um, he didn't failing, job. yeah, failing his residency stop him from becoming a doctor anyway. No, definitely not, because <laughs> the, the bad doctors never let anything stop them. <laughs> so um, John Bodkin Adams arrived in Eastbourne in 1922, and he lived with his mom and his cousin Sarah Florence Henry. In 1929, he borrowed 2,000 pounds, which is equivalent to over 100,000 pounds today, from a patient named William Mahood. Mawood? Mawood? How, <laughs> like, how would you say that? I'm on, I don't even okay. think I have that name written down. M-A-W-H-O-O-D. Mahood. Mahood. And bought an 18-room <laughs> house called Kent Lodge in Trinity Trees, which mm. used to be known as Seaside Road. So it was like a very select, very, I don't know, um, what do you call it? Exclusive. La-di-da. Yeah. 
La di da was a great word. <laughs> so Adams would frequently invite himself to the Mahoods residence at mealtime, even bringing his mom and cousin. So he also started charging items to their accounts at local stores without their permission, which I guess you can do if you're just like, oh, no, they're fine. We're, we eat dinner together. Mm-hmm. We're such good neighbors. We're like family. Mrs. Mahood would later describe Adams to the police as a real scrounger. When Mr. Mahood died in 1949, John Bodkin Adams visited his widow uninvited and took a 22 carat gold pen from her bedroom dressing table saying he wanted something of her husband's and then he never visited her again. (laughs) So just still stealing things even though the dude died. Mm -hmm. So... Gossip regarding Adam's activities and methods had started by the mid-1930s. In 1935, he had inherited over 7,000 pounds from a patient named Matilda Witten, and her whole estate amounted to um, over 1,100 pounds, which is equivalent to like 500,000 pounds today. So... Um, Witten's will was contested by her relatives, but it was upheld in court, though um, Adams giving Adams' mother 100 pounds was overturned. So Adams then began receiving anonymous postcards about him bumping off patients, as he admitted in a newspaper interview in 1957. These were received at a rate of three or four a year until the Second World War and then commenced again in 1945. So people are telling on him to the newspaper yeah when he first moved to Eastbourne in Sussex he basically went there with nothing and started his practice and because he was very good at being manipulative and weaseling his way into people's wills like also in this town that he's in it's primarily older people Um, so he manipulates his way into wills and stuff and gets rich pretty quickly and that's how he's able to afford such a lavish lifestyle and would even do some house calls and just conveniently they were around dinner time and yeah would stay for dinner and stuff and like how weird yeah steal from his patients homes yeah i don't know about you guys but like at dinner time like i want (laughs) to go to my house for dinner Mm -hmm. different times it was a different time back then Mm-hmm. So John Bodkin Adams became one of the wealthiest general practitioners in Britain, and eventually the town did start growing suspicious um, after the death of Mrs. Gertrude Hulet. Uh, There was an anonymous call on July 23rd, 1956 to authorities suggesting an investigation. So he started potentially or allegedly killing patients in the 1930s. And this goes on for 20 years. Finally, it's the 1950s where someone's like, hey, someone should check this guy out. Mm Mm-hmm. So the Eastbourne police uh, passed the tip along to the Scotland Yard and a detective, Superintendent Hubern Hannum, was on the case. Uh, There were 310 death certificates issued between 1946 and 1956. Ten years, 310 death certificates issued by Dr. Adams. The information or these certificates were passed along to a pathologist and the pathologist asked to uh, review, no, the pathologist reviewed them and deemed 163 of them to be very suspicious. Detective Hannum interviewed other doctors in the area, uh, but after the British Medical Association stepped in about doctor and patient confidentiality, only two doctors were willing to really speak to authorities. I don't know if the detective was just trying to get more information on Adams or maybe just learn more about practice in general. 
maybe to see what kind of, I don't know, amount of death certificates they submit. Well, Who knows? I don't know why. I mean, but they, so they made the decision only to focus on the, the the 310 death certificates from 1946 to 1956. It doesn't really say why, but I would love Mm -hmm. to know why. Mm -hmm. Instead of the ones before that? Because there were a lot before that, because clearly he was very wealthy, and this did not start in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. But we'll never know. I know, but I want to (laughs) know. How will I sleep at night? (laughs) So Dr. Adams um, does get questioned by the detective and pleaded that he had no interest in money and he was only interested in the well-being of his patients. Uh, There was evidence finally that surfaced of how John Adams was manipulative and incompetent. There was evidence of patients receiving meds that they weren't prescribed and he also forged prescriptions. Uh, Adams hinted to possibly killing out of mercy, though, because, again, they were older patients. Maybe some of them weren't doing so well. It kind of goes back to Harold Shipman a little bit in that regard. Just older patients, were they mercy killings? But Harold Shipman wasn't working his way into wills like this guy was. Uh, Detective Hannum finally gathered enough evidence to make a case against Adams in December 1956. Prosecutors decided to arrest Adams on two accounts of murder of Edith Alice Morrell, Merrill and uh, Gertrude Houlette. December 19th, he was arrested, and then the trial started. So Edith Morrell died November 13th, 1950, and she left Adams a Rolls-Royce car and... Sheesh. Yeah. And some antique cutlery. She apparently died of a stroke. And then Gertrude Houlette left Adams a share of her estate after dying from a suspicious amount of heroin and morphine found in her system. So he most likely overdeed her or overdosed her, OD'd her. See, now I've got you on the same page as me, (laughs) tripping over your words. Uh, You're welcome. (laughs) It's not Monday. feels like a Monday. Every Wednesday feels like a Monday to me. I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, no, he was definitely using morphine for some patients even earlier on, and they were saying, like, like the families were like, her health deteriorated, their health was deteriorating, Mm -hmm. like, from the morphine. And so morphine and heroin, wow. Yeah. Like, doesn't he think it's weird, too, like, that people continuously leave things for him in their wills like it doesn't occur to him like that's like a red flag what you, for him like for yeah like or for in other, general for like he's people. like for people to continuously leave their possessions to him like mm-hmm. there's no one else you like could have left it to and it's like yeah. every time a patient dies he's like oh look at me <laughs> like, he probably picks and chooses patients though I don't know. like Probably some of these elderly people don't have a lot of family around or sure. anybody who's paying attention to them closely. But anyone who's like around him and is like, oh my God, like your patients must just really love you. Yeah. Like, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the detective is, mm-hmm. that's a lot of his evidence is like, come on, you guys. Like, why are all of his elderly sure. patients leaving him all of the stuff and then suddenly dying all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the trial went from November 18th, 1957 to April 15th, 1957. And when John Adams, or during this time in April, John Adams was actually acquitted after an expert said that it was unclear if Adams was really responsible for the death of Edith Merrill's. Because again, she died from an apparent stroke. I don't know if there was anything really weird in her autopsy. Um, eventually, uh, the attorney general withdrew charges on Houlette's case as well. And just like that, he was freed. So apparently the evidence just wasn't good enough. But also, charges were dropped due to... I'm not even going to be able to pronounce this right. Even though I just checked... Nole 
Prosecchi. That's not right. Cut um, that out. No, leave it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it sounded French. No le prosequa. I think it was something more like that. So that phrase essentially means um, the charges can be dropped because... Oh, Prosecchi. But it's, yeah, it's pronounced Prosequa. It is? Mm-hmm. Mm. Hold on. I feel like this is Latin. All this law stuff is Latin, isn't it? Noli Oh, so, prosequi. Noli prosequi. Like, okay. Okay. Anyway. Sorry, I'm just, I'm on Google too. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. So that is, while I have the definition pulled up, a formal notice of abandonment by a plaintiff or prosecutor hmm. of all or part of a suit or action. Wow. So they just were like, okay, we've got nothing, so we're mm-hmm. done. Also, though, uh, John Adams was friends with the chief constable, Richard Walker, and the mayor of Eastbourne, Sir Roland Gwynn. So he was friends with a lot of people higher up there, so he could probably pull some strings to get his name removed. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, also, yeah. Then there were some notebooks from nurses that worked with Doctor Adams that mysteriously disappeared and reappeared once the once he was acquitted and freed. Mm-hmm. So just one of those situations where maybe he was prepared for this too. He just kind of worked himself in with all the higher ups, and that's what you do. You assimilate. Mm-hmm. You join their culture. Their mm-hmm. but and I think he used to like vacation with the, these people. So mm-hmm. you know, I don't know what this has to do anything, but it was rumored that he had a homosexual relationship with the mayor of Eastbourne too. Oh snap! So he just had everyone on his side. I know he was engaged once, but hmm. he called it off. Um, but he remained friends with her. Her name was Nora O'Hara, and. They remained friends for the rest of their lives, and he remembered her in his will. Oh, how lovely. How good for Nora. Nora, you really dodged mm, a bullet. Yeah, Nora's probably like, please don't. You can just delete me from all that. <laughs> just delete my name. Uh, um, so several defense lapses went unchallenged, and I do have... I didn't want to write them all down, but in the book Medical Monsters, there was a list of some of his victims and just how they died and what they left to Adams in their will. So there was Anne Ware. She died February 1950, leaving him 1,000 pounds in her will. And in the weeks leading up to her death, Adams banned her relatives from seeing her. And once she oh. did die, he uh, arranged a hasty cremation. So no one could look into her body. Wow. Mm-hmm. There was also Annabelle Kilgore. She died December 28th, 1950, leaving him 200 pounds. So some of these people didn't leave him a lot, but, I mean, 200 pounds was a lot time. back then, though. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, a nurse who attended Miss Kilgore later stated that Adams gave the patient an overdose of sedatives. Then there was uh, Julia Bradnam, and she left him 661 pounds. Very wow. odd number. And he had taken great pains to ensure that her financial matters were in order prior to her death. He would even accompany her to the bank and convinced her to make him a part of her will or one of her beneficiaries. And on the day that she died, she like apparently was super healthy. Everything was fine. She was doing housework. People saw her out and about. Um, But then that night, she took a turn for the worst and didn't make it. Mm. Suspicious. Well, do you want some bad news and good news? What you got? There's good news? (laughs) Well, there's funniest news. We'll we'll take some good news. Well, the bad news is that after all this happens, he is restored back to his former glory as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And 
then he tries to come to America, but he's denied. That is good news, too. <laughs> I didn't know he tried coming over yeah, here. He applied for a visa in 1962, and they said, nah. Nice. And, but then um, he died in 1983 because he slipped and fractured his hip. It says while shooting in battle in East Sussex, but either way, he slipped and fractured his hip, and then it caused it an infection in his chest and he died on the 4th of July. Hmm. Huh. He died on the 4th of July. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 1983. Wow. So there were all these victims that didn't really get brought to justice or he didn't get brought to justice um he did not there were a few times he got some slaps on the wrist um after he was acquitted and everything Mm -hmm. Uh, like the town there was town gossip of him being a murderer his license to practice medicine was withdrawn for a while um and because of um the conviction of forging prescriptions and false statements on cremation forms he was fined 2400 pounds but then he was able to sell his story to a newspaper and made 10,000 pounds from that um and yeah he reinstated his medical practitioner license in 1961 but yeah didn't pursue anything i didn't know he tried coming to the u.s Mm -hmm. (laughs) yep so i guess he just like worked by himself Hmm. as a practitioner for a while and I don't know, ended up in some <laughs> battle in East Sussex. Yeah, I don't know. I I read that he had heart failure, but either way, he did die July 4th, 1983, and he died with an estate of 402,970 pounds, and he was 84 years old. Mm-hmm. Bam. Yep. Yeah. He did die of left ventricular fail- failure. So okay. he, it's because he slipped, fractured his hip, went to the hospital, got okay. a chest infection, and then ultimately his heart said, nah. <laughs> nah, that's enough. Dang. <sighs> so yeah, for a super religious person, he did a lot of naughty things. I really feel like he was just out here living life, swaying in the wind, not caring about a single person or a thing. Yep, it's all about the money, and he didn't get caught for 20-plus years. Like, it sucks. It's like, he didn't even do anything cool with the money, I don't think, you know? I mean, he had a super lavish mansion and would ride around in his super nice Rolls-Royce cars, and do it. who knows what else he was doing in his spare time. <laughs> but having an affair with the mayor. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. Allegedly. Dang. Well, it sucks that, you know, nobody got justice and those victims didn't get justice. But it's like you trust your doctor. And, of course, house calls back then were Mm -hmm. normal. Yeah. And, yep, and elderly people, the technology wasn't really there to Mm -hmm. get all the evidence that we can get today, find everything in autopsies, etc., all right, that's Dr. John Bodkin Adams. Who are we talking about Ooh. next week? <laughs> um, next week, we're talking about a guy named Theo V and a lady named Heather Presty. Yes, these two have nothing to do with each other, but they're two more recent cases, and there's not a lot on them, so we're just going to chat about them both in yep. one episode. For show. So we got an old old case and then two super recent cases. The fact that there are recent cases is just so annoying to me. Mm-hmm. And who knows how many else or how many more don't are out there. <laughs> don't say that. I know. It's just one of those things you don't want to think about. But we'll dive more into that next time. So tune in next, next week. Next, next week. All right. And don't do anything that John Bodkin Adams would do. Thank you for listening to Healthcare Horrors brought to you by Atlas Medstaff. Just a reminder, we are not healthcare professionals. We are just fans of true crime talking about some of history's darkest moments in healthcare. Stay tuned, stay healthy, and stay safe. Healthcare. 
mer.